athletics week out of the year. I know. Thank you, kids. Absolutely. Is there a motion to adopt the agenda? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Anyone here to address the board? Mr. Potter, a uh, reminder that members of the board may not discuss items that are not specifically identified on the agenda. Therefore, pursuant to ARS 3 431.01H, action taken as a result of the comment will be limited to directing staff to study the matter, responding to any criticism, or scheduling the matter for a future agenda. The board requests that all comments be limited to a few minutes or less, and that the public refrain from the use of speech or language as offensive or inappropriate, pursuant to board policy KFA. Leon Potter. Leon Potter, 43539 West Roth Road, Maricopa. Uh, President Bardo, uh, board, governing board members, I come to, before you as the head coach of uh, Maricopa Wells uh, Middle School uh, as soccer coach. We had a real good season this, uh, this year. We finished uh, ranked third, had a heck of a game against the uh, Desert Wind Tigers. Uh, we, we outlasted them after they beat us twice the regular season. We outlasted them in the semifinals. Uh, fortunately, one school was able to represent the school district in the finals. And we went 0-0, an exciting game through shootouts. We came up short. Uh, Mount Vista um, won, the, won the game today, right before the rain broke. Um, but I'm very proud of the girls, uh, Maricopa Well Panthers. We finished uh, number two um, in my book, number one. Uh, and I told them from the beginning to play hard all season. Their improvement along the way was awesome. Unfortunately, um, only one team can, can be a winner. But again, uh, it was a great season for both both teams in the school district, and I'm very proud of Maricopa Wells Panthers. Thank you. Are we on now? Yeah. Is that better? I apologize. Shall I start over? Okay. <laughs> there we go. Let's start over. Um, the first recognition goes to our HMA Public Relations in recognition of their work over the last year and unfortunately the end of their contract that's being renewed um, for the following year. I have a letter that I would like to read. Governing Board Members, MUSD staff and administration. It has been a pleasure working with you and the district over the past year. Although we are disappointed that due to budget constraints we are unable to continue, we know you will continue to see much success in sharing the wonderful things the district has going on. The media in Maricopa are eager to share the good news of the district and will no doubt continue to support you in your endeavors. Continued good luck to you and the members of the governing board. Take care and hope our paths will cross again in the future. So we do appreciate all of their time and energy that they've spent helping us over the last year to promote all the great thing that's been going on in our district. The next recognition goes to our elementary academic league students. And I'm going to introduce Ms. Janet Stensgard and Dr. Jen Robinson, who have organized this event this year. And always, it ends up being such a fantastic um, competition. And I don't know if we can even say friendly competition because yesterday when I was there, it wasn't, it was, um, it was somewhat intense. <laughs> so um, it's always exciting to see our students and our parents and the support of our district and especially the amount of time that our academic league coaches from each school spend in preparing our students. And as we know, with every great student, we also have great parents. And so we appreciate all the support that we have from our parents. We really do appreciate it. So with that, Ms. Stensgard, Dr. Robinson, it's all yours. Thank you for inviting us here this evening. Um, we would like to introduce the coaches at each school and then um, have the students come forward. Um, 
Team Santa Rosa, the coaches were Lorena Ellard and Aaron Bell. Um, Santa Cruz, uh, Dr. John Flores and Corey Mexi, if you could come forward. Mar <laughs> Maricopa Elementary, Christine Dickinson and Jyothi Soto. Butterfield, John McGuire and Carrie Russell. Saddleback, Tanya Nielsen and Monica Owen. And from Pima Butte, Elena Leos and Betty Graham. We would also like the students to come forward. If the students could come forward and stand near your coaches. <laughs> um, We're pleased to announce that all six schools were, um, did participate this year. We started in January. We had three competitions with our final last night. What we decided to do was we have a traveling trophy that we uh, brought back. So fourth grade Butterfield was the winner of that um, traveling trophy. And fifth grade, Pima Butte. We would like to thank the coaches. We would like to thank the parents. And why we're here, we would like to thank the students for participating. Thank you. The next, the next recognition, <laughs> I'll wait a minute, <laughs> I'm not even going to try. Yeah, it's on. Oh, I could, I could definitely use the teacher voice or the mother voice. <laughs> Okay, I would like to recognize our budget committee members for 2011-12. Looking at the actual budget process that we had this year, we gathered a group of community members, teachers, board members, staff, um, and it really became a great process where there, I, I really believe that all voices were heard. It started at the staff level, and then it was brought into the committee where each principal had their site, um, provide recommendations to the budget committee, and then the budget committee did the work accordingly. I do need just, well, I will go ahead and fill in the information in the informational item on the next, um, when we do information item work study, but they spent many, many hours away from their families dedicated to our district and their work does not go unrecognized, so I just would like to recognize our budget committee. I have one more recognition in there, and I know I'm not supposed to do this, but I'm going to do it anyways. The perfect attendance banquet was scheduled this last Thursday for our elementary, and out of all the events that I think I've been to this year, it was probably the most positive. I really have to say thank you. I hope Mr. Kamarczyk is, yes, there he is. Um, Mr. Kramarczyk is our president for the Maricopa Education Foundation and the excitement that our students not only were they recognized for their perfect attendance and that's not an easy task but they were provided an opportunity to win gift cards from Yogurt Jungle, Target and one young lady from Butterfield won the iPod Touch. Mm -hmm. So it, it was an exciting time. It was a time for all of the staff, for um, the principals, the elementary principals district staff. It was 
fantastic to see Mr. Roush and Mr. Beckett with their aprons on cooking. And Miss uh, Suzette Moe and Patty Yates did a fantastic job organizing the event. So just, um, we have our secondary luncheon this next week, recognizing our perfect attendance. And if you're available, please attend. That concludes the superintendent's report. <coughs> President Bartlett, two quick comments. I was able to be um, participate in the academic league, and it was so exciting to see these kids be excited and know that they're cool for being smart. Um, I was got to read some of the things and the questions. Good thing I had the answers because I didn't know the answers. So uh, it was very exciting, and I'm, I'm I think it's wonderful that we're able to celebrate not only the perfect attendance but the academics, and I think that there's a, it's a whole new sport, and it was, you know, there was probably a couple hundred parents there in the multi-purpose room at the end, and I think that that speaks volumes for our students and the quality that we have here at, at uh, Maricopa. So thank you, staff and students, and mostly parents. So, and <coughs> Jackson was very excited to go to the perfect attendance lunch and to be with the administration. So nice, <coughs> nice, nice job, thank you. Uh, I just had the pleasure of um, being part of the community car wash last Saturday. I took my youngest and Noah and I were out there washing cars over at Santa Rosa and it was a wonderful day. It really did bring out the whole meaning of community. And we met an, an individual who had just moved into Providence the night before and he came over to get his car wash and he was just thrilled at how our community comes together and how friendly we are. So it was a great, it was a great idea and I hope we do this again. Okay. Well, I have also a report, and I'm excited to report this. I also sit on the um, Auction Indian Communities Education Committee as the chairperson, and I've been involved in various meetings and activities with the Auction Community Council, Auction Education Department, and in trying to work toward um, improving our student attendance and increasing their achievement. So I just wanted to share that, that you know, especially their achievements, we have very we have um, wonderful Native American kids who can achieve highly, and um, we're kind of at a low at this point, and we really want to see them increase um, and achieve at MUSD. So that's been part of my whole life on the other side of the tracks, but you know, I'm proud to, to present that. I, too, went to the car wash, but I apologize. I brought my bicycle on my car. <laughs> so I will get over to Santa Rosa and make sure I... Get your car over there. Yeah, he was supposed to go. Yeah, it's going to be Just one other comment. Let the folks know that on Saturday evening at Eric Wells Middle School, the Miracle Education Foundation is hosting uh, an event to recognize our teachers. So I believe Jeff's going to come on. Tickets are still available until tomorrow. Yep. Great, so go to your closest school tomorrow and pick up tickets. Um, very few causes more worthy than recognizing our teachers for what they do in the classroom day in and day out for our kids. So thank you for putting that on. Yeah. Information items and website. Dr. Conlon. inside the microphone. Good evening, Aaron Rausch, uh, Director of Business Services. Um, President Bartle, members of the, of the board, I um, gave a memo of the analysis of the IGA to you, and I'll just briefly go over that. <clears throat> we know that um, the IGA in the IGA uh, states that uh, um, the fields should be maintained uh, at the same level of, as all the fields uh, that the city um, maintains, and that's stated in the IGA. <clears throat> we also know that there's been a transition of staff, new parks and recs director, and I think there's been a void there for a while. So with that, um, our analysis is that uh, we do have spots on the field that, that need to be receded that need to uh, be addressed and um, um, some top dressing and 
fertilizing. We also noted that uh, um, uh, we don't think the, the grass has been cut to at least our standard, so we noted that, passed that on to the city. Uh, we, we also uh, noted and passed that on that uh, the edging on the ball fields wasn't up to our standard. Um, also, that uh, uh, there's, there's more, uh, and it's, it's hard with, with budgets, but there's more weeds on the field that, uh, that we, uh, that we uh, would have maintained at a certain level. Um, we did have a, um, a water pump that's our equipment break, and we're replacing that equipment. Um, and I know the city has replaced a good deal of, of the uh, uh, irrigation heads, but we did note that there are some that still need to be done. Um, we look forward, the positive things, we look forward, we have a new Parks and Recs director, and we look forward to uh, some positive uh, working relationships to get all these issues resolved. So with that, entertain any questions? Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. President, members of the school board, um, I, I just wanted to, to congratulate the, the board, um, oh, Paul Jepson, City of Maricopa staff. Um, and just, uh, we, are, uh, we worked real hard to get this IGA going, and it, it's, it's um, uh, a work in progress, but we've done well. And um, I remember how excited we were when we got this passed, and we're moving forward. Uh, but I do have Jennifer Campbell here, our new uh, development uh, community service director who's going to uh, give a little presentation. Good evening, Mr. President, members of the board. Jennifer Campbell, the new Community Services Director for the City of Maricopa. Thank you very much for letting me present tonight on this. Um, first, just wanted to go ahead and give you, um, oh great, this works, a little bit of <laughs> overview about myself. Um, as uh, Mr. President Bartlett had um, went ahead and told me before, um, he did read the article on me. Thank you very much. He knew what city I came from. I appreciate that. Um, first, uh, again, Jennifer Campbell, Director of Community Services. Um, I have a bachelor's degree in recreation management from Arizona State University. I have a master's in educational leadership and public administration from uh, Northern Arizona University. Um, I have more than 17 years experience um, in the field of parks and recreation. I'm a certified park and rec professional as well as getting a smart cert Smartscape certification, which deals with landscaping, turf, plants, things like that. Um, also this year I attended my first year of the Parks Maintenance Management School that's offered through the National Recreation and Park Association, which is a national accredited um, agency for park and recreation professionals, and I completed my first year. Um, I've joined the city uh, as of April 30th, so I'm on my eighth day. Um, <laughs> Also, I am a fellow educator. I've actually been adjunct faculty at Glendale Community College and ASU West since 2003. So I'm educating them once they get a little bit older um, and enjoy that very much. And I'm super happy that I just finished three classes this semester as of last night. Um, all right, so a couple things. Wanted to talk about a couple of the current issues. Um, I have been out to both of the facilities, both Desert Winds and Maricopa Wells, um, with my uh, park supervisor, Monica Rubio, to take a look. And obviously, there has been minimal maintenance that's been done over the fields in the last couple years. Um, obviously, for a school district, your main priority is to educate children. I mean, it is. It's not going to be in field maintenance. That's what we're supposed to do. Um, we've seen a couple areas that do have excessive wear and tear. If you look at a soccer field, you can definitely tell where the kids mill around or on a ball field where certain kids stand in certain positions. So you're going to have wear and tear on fields um, that tends to be excessive in different positions. Um, lack of funding, obviously, um, it's been tough. Economy's been tough. It's hit cities, school districts, things like that. And, you know, budgets have been cut. So, of course, through lack of funding, you really have to prioritize what you're going to spend money on. So um, I think hopefully with the economy getting better and budgets getting better, uh, the city's looking forward to putting some um, true money into these fields as well. Um, the water issues, uh, we are aware that some pump systems have gone down. Um, the city will be taking control of the irrigation controllers to go ahead and water. And with anything that's living and growing, just like human beings, we need water to grow and to get better. So we're looking forward to getting some more water on that turf to make it a lot greener. Um, contractor issues. Uh, I know, of course, being my eighth day, uh, we did have some contractor issues. We had went ahead and uh, put out an RFP when it first started uh, back in September. And the firm that we had chosen apparently went under. So we had to go out for that process. And with any government, processes with budget and procurement can be a little bit lengthy. So we do have a new contractor on board. Um, 
and they seem to be working out. Um, also, there's no overseeding on the fields. So uh, what basically you have Bermuda. And for us to take over, really, it's about it's been six months since November. Bermuda goes dormant, or I like to say goes to sleep in the winter and then takes a while to come back. And of course, in order to bring that turf back, you're going to have to aerate and you're going to have to fertilize and things like that. So this is about the time when we need to start getting that grass green and bringing it back. Just want to talk a little bit about our maintenance moving forward. Um, our weekly landscape will be uh, performed by JNC Landscaping, which is the contractor procured by the city. Uh, their duties include irrigation audits, setting a watering schedule for the turf, replacing sprinkler heads and valves, mowing and weed control. Um, some of the upcoming field maintenance that the city will be providing is we are going to be aerating the turf the week of May 28th, so once school is out. Uh, we're going to be fertilizing the turf for the first week of June. Uh, we've actually hired a contractor, um, Terry O'Neill, with Accurate Ball Fields to come out and look. So we're going to be skinning all the infields and replacing the bases, um, and also edging the infields at um, Desert Winds. So we're going to be closing down the fields uh, to the public May 28th through June 22nd. Um, it's really hard. I've been, I actually started as a rec person. So it was always a battle between parks and rec. We wanted to program, and they needed some downtime. Luckily, after getting into parks in the last several years, I completely understand that relationship. And you know, like anything, grass needs time to recreate and grow and get some rest. So we're looking forward to having this downtime on the turf to really start to make it look better. Um, as I stated before, we've basically been in active control of the fields for six months, and of course with Bermuda, it's been dormant. Um, it is going to take a little bit of time for these fields to improve, but we're really going to work on getting these fields looking good so that your students as well as the local organizations and city programs have great fields to play on. Uh, regular maintenance will occur, as well as the aeration and fertilization is needed. It'll be provided by the city. We've got field maintenance um, plans in place as far as what we're doing each week. Um, communication, um, I really like to streamline that. I understand a lot of times when things break, you know, how fast are we being told? The communication has got to be open and it has to be constant for this IGA to work. So want to look at some new communication plans as well. Um, and we will move forward with incorporating a lot of this into the IGA to make sure that it's written because, you know, we need to make sure that we understand what our obligation is to you and that we're fulfilling it. Um, and I do want to thank Monica Rubio, the park supervisor, for, again, assisting me with this PowerPoint and really filling me in, as well as um, Paul Jepson um, kind of giving me the background on the IGA. So just to kind of end, um, does anybody have any questions or comments? I have to make a comment. What are you going to do on your ninth day? <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is very impressive. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. I do appreciate that. It's been a whirlwind. My head has basically stopped spinning. But just as a joke today, this is my second time getting wet because um, when we went out to Maricopa Wells to test the irrigation and the sprinklers, <laughs> I told Monica, I said, Monica, you know what? Our luck, we're going to get caught in one of the sprinklers. And sure enough, you hear it go. It's behind me. Next thing I know, whole left side is wet. So second time today, so I, I think I've dried off and I'm doing pretty good. Very nice. Thank you. Thank you very much again. Yeah. Thank you. I look forward to working with all of you. And again, thank you for allowing me to present. And um, good luck with the rest of your meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next informational work study item is our MHS Athletic and Activities Academic Expectations and Ms. Salaya, High School Principal. Thank you, Dr. Conley. Good evening, uh, President Bartle, members of the board. Um, I'm here tonight to answer any questions you have regarding athletic eligibility. I did send you some information. Um, I sent you some numbers as well. Uh, the first thing I wanted to recognize is that when we looked at athletic eligibility throughout the county and um, we also looked at Chandler, we also looked at Desert Vista. It is a no pass, no play is uh, what their laws or excuse me, their policy is and that's according to AIA rules and also Arizona state law. Uh, within that capacity, we as a district have the ability to uh, change that and raise it so to speak as long as you meet the no pass, no play. Uh, you can raise that to a C 
uh, or better. Okay, but let me explain that what that looks like is that a student, if you were to raise it to a C, it doesn't mean it's a C average. It means that that student must have a C in every single class because anything less than a C in a class would make them ineligible. Okay, and just in terms of numbers, um, in looking at, and I think you've got the combined totals of Ds and Fs. So what I did is I took the Ds and Fs and separated them. Um, and those numbers sound like this. Um, we had a total of 555 players, mm -hmm. okay? 130 of those players had Fs and became ineligible. 177 remained eligible because of the D policy, the no pass, no play. So they passed with a D in all of their classes and were able to participate. Um, as we continue to move forward with the conversation, um, I did include, you know, really what we're asking is how does the changing, how does changing the current academic eligibility requirements of no pass, no play for athletics um, and activities at MHS to a minimum grade of C or above impact the athletic and activity program? Those are the numbers that support that. That gives you kind of an idea of how it would impact that. Um, and then I had to ask myself, what steps can we take at Maricopa High School to improve the athletic academic success? Because clearly it's a student achievement issue for us. So before um, I give my two cents, do you have questions that I can answer for you? I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, if you'll just clarify, this is each class. So they could have six classes. They could have maybe a D in one class. They could have A's and B's in the other classes. Correct. Correct. So it's just for that one class. It's not they have, overall they, grade. They cannot average. fall below a D in any class in they any have. Class, but they still technically could be getting A's and B's in the other oh, classes. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. But for a C, I, I, are you asking about the C policy or the D policy? The D po whether it's D or C. If I it's mean, a C, it's the thing. Class, right. The thing to be clear average. about is that. A C, if it's a D policy, it's not an average. If it's a C policy, it's not an average. They have to maintain a D in every, at least a D in every class in order to play. If you choose to make that a C, it has to be a C, at least a C in every class to play, as opposed to an average of all the grades together. Because that would imply that you could have A, Bs in some classes and have an F in one class, but when you average it all together, it becomes a C. That doesn't abide by state law or AIA regs. Any other questions? I'm just waiting to hear the, sec the answers to the second question well, because that's what really, that's really kind of where, mm -hmm. at least for me, I want to see those things put in place mm -hmm. so that, you know, we can hold our students accountable mm -hmm. to a C average, but we can't do that if we don't have the supports in place for them. Absolutely. And I think that's where, um, you know, I think that there's an infrastructure that has to be in place, as I've said before in order to put that policy in, in, in place. That infrastructure sounds and looks like, you know, having um, an accountability piece for coaches and making sure all the coaches are on the same page and making academics first, making sure coaches are mentors beyond athletics, that they are mm -hmm. also academic mentors. Um, it looks like student uh, tutoring centers twice a week where you start pra practice later um, and perhaps you know, have teachers or pay teachers to be and man those tutoring centers so that kids are there um, working on their academics before they get to the fields um, and starting practice a little bit later. That needs, you know, the cooperation of a couple things, uh, one being transportation. But those are the infrastructure pieces that I think need to be in place before we jump to a C um, policy. Um, I, I feel like, you know, the student achievement has to be addressed on a global picture. And those scores are starting to come up. There's some things that we're doing that are starting to work. Um, do I think it's the right time right now to, to make that uh, policy in place or put that policy in place? I don't, but I appreciate and, and agree that we need to set that standard somewhere. Mm -hmm. We also need to be competitive. I mean, we do have to ask ourselves if, you know, the surrounding communities are all following AIA regs, mm -hmm. which is no pass, no play, then we have to have, I think, for us, um, and I guess it's how, how you look at it, you know, we're either, you know, having a higher um, requirement of our athletes than surrounding communities, and then I would ask, what does that do to our athletic program? And clearly, just by looking at the numbers that you have, you know, you can see that it, it's, an, it's a student achievement issue. Yeah, but if, if we, I really believe if we encourage mm -hmm. our, our students and, you know, 
if our students are just skating by with a D in a class, <coughs> how is that really preparing them for life after high school? Even if, if whether it be secondary education or career, mm -hmm. um, we we need to be able to encourage them, support them, and hold them accountable because some of the kids they know they just want to play sports and they're just going to skate by to get that D and keep mm -hmm. being eligible. And I I understand that the other schools and, and nearby districts don't require that. And I'm okay with once we have our tools in place. If we have that requirement of a C and they don't make it and they want to go to another school, okay, we're going to have a higher grade point average, higher test scores, higher graduation rate. And I'm okay with that mm -hmm. because then the other kids will start seeing that in the other districts and they're going to want to come to us mm -hmm. because we do hold the academics important because that's ultimately why we're here. Absolutely, and I don't think there's any question that there's academics first. Um, I do try and look at both ends of the spectrum because I look at the um, student that is diligently working in AP classes and maybe a gifted student that's very gifted in one area but not another. So they're getting A's and B's in an AP class, but AP calculus or even geometry just isn't working for that student. And so now that student, that highly successful student across the board is not eligible to participate in athletics because they're not functioning at a high enough level in one area. So. You know, that's just something that we think about as well. Mr. Irving? Uh, yeah, to move it beyond a talking stage, I would love to volunteer because I think what you're asking for is a real plan. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you know me, I love to volunteer. I would love to get together with a group and talk to people like Tina Dugan or involved in the boosters and commit to the board. We'll submit to you mm -hmm. a plan by, let's say, September about how we're going to do those things you want. Because mm -hmm. my fear is, I'm with you. We'll just keep talking about mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. So I'll talk to Ms. Salai, we already talked about yeah. it, and we'll give you a real step-by-step -step plan about how to accomplish what you want to do. I think the kids would really benefit from that. Yeah, I, I don't think there's any question. I do too. I think, you know, part of it is sustainability. It's something that we want to be able to do, sustain, and, you know, um, in our athletic program, as we look at the next year, we, we analyze all of that, what's working, what's not. And I think what we've done a really good job with this year, Mr. Winters has done it, is really setting some standards for our coaches. And that was a piece that we really needed to do. And I think we'll continue that charge. And now we can, uh, once mm -hmm. we have that in place in a common handbook and a common language for every coach, um, then we can sit now and have that plan that you're, you're referencing. And, and my concern is it's more encompassing. I have a hard time, and I'm glad we want to raise it to the C, but you can graduate from Maricopa High School with a one point on grade So any, any I would like to see us. Well, but I'm with Patty on this. I, I, yeah. I don't care about any school. I, I, so we'll get a plan, I think, to do at least that, but mm -hmm. I think it'll also encompass everything. So Thank I you, and I, you I appreciate you know, the challenge to do that. I think okay. that's, um, it's important. I will share with you that I did check with um, counterparts in TUSD because it's such a large district. Mm -hmm. I spoke with the director of interscholastics um, down there for the entire district, and it was interesting to hear a couple things. Um, one was that they have, many schools have looked at this and have had this conversation mm -hmm. for very different reason. They had the conversation from a budgetary standpoint. They were looking to raise that to a C so that, not because they didn't believe in academic success or want the same things that we're talking about this evening, but that it actually became a, a, a place for very big districts where they were decreasing some of the, um, you know, A and B sort of activities. So your freshman B team, for example. There's A teams and B teams in very big schools. And mm -hmm. so you're eliminating some of those just by academic uh, requirements. Um, the other thing I did learn too, and I think we can learn from it, is I believe it's Santa Rita or Rincon, I can't remember, and TUSD is piloting it next year. So that district, which has 11 high schools, is trying it out with one high school to see mm -hmm. how it impacts the program. So I spoke with Mr. House down there. I'm going to look for his data and information um, and see what happened and how it worked for them. And I think we can come back we with that and then make I mean, an educated Ultimately, it's going to help our student achievement, yeah. Oh, yeah. which will bring more kids <laughs> Absolutely. into the district. So I think it's a great goal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. Don't we already have tutoring in place? Yeah. Okay. We do. We do have tutoring. I think I want it a little more intense. Um, in terms of, you know, I want, it, I want it to be a requirement for a couple days a week. I want it to be manned by the right teachers and ensure that they're there mm -hmm. because the kids can tend to go, you know, they're going to different classrooms and different teachers now and, 
you know, I just, I want a commitment from a teacher on Tuesday, those two or one math teacher is going to be there for those kids. Do you know what I mean? It's just mm -hmm. bringing it in a little bit, tightening it up, and I think, um, you know, if I can work with transportation, because one of the issues I found out was if we, um, if we did that two days a week and then we started practice later, then practice is, you know, tailored down to about an hour. Mm -hmm. um, so that becomes, but just details that I think we can continu continue to work on. It's that darn budget. We can still do it. Just because it takes money. <laughs> Just a little. I could include that within my site budget. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for the opportunity. I think I'm staying up here. Right? Yeah. Okay. Jack, Jack. Okay, um, I wanted my second opportunity tonight is to just discuss with you and go over with you the Maricopa Online uh, Program, the Credit Recovery Program, and the Enrichment Program. Uh, I want to start by talking about the impact of Maricopa Online, which is the um, self-contained school, uh, which currently houses, um, there's 90 students now throughout there, there's been 169. So that includes uh, some of the homeschool kids. So you have um, the, the purpose and the, the way that you are able to enroll in that program currently is if high school students are five or more credits behind, okay, for graduation. So at that point, we look at their transcripts, we evaluate <coughs> their uh, plan, uh, their graduation plan, and make a determination if this will benefit them. Uh, there's two things to that. One is that takes them out of a school of 1,600 kids or 14 or 1,500 kids, depending on the year, um, and puts them in a much smaller concentrated environment. Um, very often what we found is those kids are liking that. Um, they are now have their own uh, community. They all feel a little bit more comfortable in a smaller environment. So about 100, there's a number of students, is 169, when I say including homeschool, uh, that does represent the kids that are working completely from home in our online program. The uh, staffing for that currently as it stands is one counselor and a behavior tech. Okay, uh, the, the cost of the program for this as of March, I didn't have the April information at the time, was $78,000, um, totaling $165,000 uh, so far. Okay, that includes your staffing and our current billing just for the Maricopa online program. Okay, uh, when we look at what does the revenue look like? Well, the revenue right now as it stands is in the retention of your students. Uh, one of the things I'm faced with consistently at the high school is when they are so far behind and they feel like they're not able to graduate, they leave me. They either get their GED or not. Um, or they go to one of the other uh, schools that provides an online opportunity because this is a way for them uh, to move through some credits a little quicker. Um, so in terms of student revenue, I, I looked at it from the standpoint of if we've retained 169 of those students uh, at $3,200 a kid, that's $540,000. So that's what the district gets uh, for the full-time students that are enrolled in the program. Historically, what percentage of the kids that fall in this category do you need? Um, within the online program? The, right now, we're basing this number on 100%, as if 100% of those mm -hmm. kids would be mm -hmm. above the district. Mm -hmm. Is that realistic? Or um, I believe my number was 44. So if you take 44 off of that number, <coughs> what's hap what I'm seeing is they're leaving and they're coming back. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so 44 kids were dropped out you know, of the program and then came back in the program. Uh, the other portion of that is, um, like I said, the homeschool kids we didn't have before. So these are kids that were actually being homeschooled by parents and now we're homeschooling them because what we've done is provided a platform for parents to not have to be the teacher all the time. So 44 is the number that I remember that dropped out. And of those, I believe there was 12 that came back. So, so yeah. I, mm -hmm. What about when we didn't have the program? Oh, um, I didn't. You know, I didn't look up dropout rates. Um, 
But when you had Plato, I mean, that your that's where your graduation rate went way down. Is so you had Plato um, in the first year that I was here. You met your graduation rate, and then steadily each year, when you had that program, it was going down. Now your event rate is going up. Does that answer your question? I wish I had a more concrete number. I didn't think to pull the dropout number um, because the dropout number is based on the total numbers in the high school. What I have is a, what I was thinking is, is the database for this particular school. So that's what you have right now is the beginning of the database for this school. Then you would have a dropout rate for this school and you would have a dropout rate for the high school. Um, <coughs> So there were 36 seniors enrolled in that program. Uh, right now there's a graduate, as I, at the time I did this, it was 25%. I believe there's a couple more coming in. So I'm kind of excited about that because you need to remember these are kids that really had very little hope of finishing. And if you can see the light in their eyes right now that they actually are finished, that's a pretty, pretty neat thing. I will move on to uh, the impact of the credit recovery program. Now, I want to define the difference. Maricopa Online is a self-contained school on its own. It has its own number. It's not counted in with statistics that come in with Maricopa High School. It is its own school. Uh, credit recovery is what we offer the Maricopa High School students that may have uh, been unsuccessful in a class and need some additional credits or need to take something over again. Okay, you can see the numbers there in terms of uh, the 9th through 12th grades, uh, the kids, and how many is in each grade level. Um, I was surprised to see three in ninth grade at that time. I thought, you know, we've, we've, I hate to see the, the kids just in their freshman year, you know, be unsuccessful in any class. Um, right now, the total is 415. I know that my counselors are, are tallying up, you know, who needs credits for the upcoming year and who may need them beyond the regular class, you know, their class schedule, and it's quite large. Um, the number of courses completed, the last, that at the time of this print was 500, and the last time I checked it was 575 courses that were completed, that kids re recovered their credit. Uh, the cost of the program, that is what you have been saying yes to in terms of vouchers, mm -hmm. the credit re recovery program is $108,000, okay? Uh, in the table, I have a comparison uh, between Maricopa Online Credit Recovery and the Plato program, which is what was here my first year. Uh, the number of students served so far is 415 uh, in credit recovery. Plato was able to service 350. The staffing cost for credit recovery now as it exists is um, zero because we don't staff anyone for that. These kids take the classes at home. Uh, in Plato, in Plato Credit Recovery, we had two teachers. So, actually, just so that you know, those two teachers were allocated over to the online school, and I only used one of the two because I'm trying to save money. <laughs> just want you to know that. Um, the licensing, that is the instructional platform, the cost, as I said, is 108. Uh, Plato was ninety-seven thousand uh, dollars for the license to use that program. If you look at the totals right now, to date, you're at 108. Um, and with Plato, you were at 192. Um, and then one of the things that was interesting the last year we were with Plato is we had to pay for a half a year of licenses. And we always ran into that if we only had a certain amount of licenses and then a couple more kids needed it, then we had to go buy more. And so that just became a big mess. Um, Ms. Anderson, to answer your question, of the 415, uh, were those multiple classes or not? Uh, yes, those are some of those kids are multiple classes. Um, I don't have an exact number. I don't know, Miss Whitware, if you remember. I know we broke it down by by grade level. An average and these were classes that they've already failed in the regular classroom, and they're recovering the credit. Correct. Um, also. Um, we were talking earlier, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move to the next slide so that I can talk about money with you because that's always at the forefront of why we're doing what we're doing and how is this going to fit into what our goals are as a district. Uh, the credit recovery will cost the district over $110,000 this year. Okay, that equates to about 2.1 teachers. I don't know, Mr. Roush, if I did my math right. It's 2.1 about right. Yeah. Um, you know, 
the 2.1 teachers could not possibly teach the classes that we are covering right now. And if you look at that, they include health, economics, Algebra 1, Algebra 1A and B, Geometry, A, B, Social Studies, Science, English, Economics, you name it, we cover it. So two teachers you would not be able to do that with. Um, and so then the question became for me, as I look at this and I look at the cost, is why are we, we did their free public education mm -hmm. the first time. And now we're doing it again. So we're paying $110,000 twice, basically. Yeah, yeah, you're paying for the, the cost twice. Um, not such a bad thing, because we really do a good job of servicing our students. Um, but you know, I think the pros of that are is that it offsets the district expenditures, because you retain students. So in that retention, you know, we get a little bit of a wash. Um, I think if we look at charging kids something, there's a little buy-in to this. Um, because here we are at the 11th hour, we're almost ready to graduate, and these kids are diligently trying to do their lessons online. Um, and there's a couple that are, they're not gonna take summer school at 250. Um, they're just gonna wait till next year and take it again online. So my question for the board is um, really, you know, what are our recommendations? Do we want the kids to have a nominal fee? Um, it's open to everyone, and I think it includes enrichment as well. If you want to take the class to get ahead, maybe there's a nominal fee. If there is uh, credit recovery, what does that fee look like? Do I want to charge people $250? No, no, but um, I, I think it's philosophical for you as a board and for us as a school. I agree. That's it. No, I just I think there's value in that, mm -hmm. um, but also maybe an incentive to at least get the D and pass the class since that mm -hmm. is the policy now. But I just I think that we need to add value to what our teachers do uh, mm -hmm. and have a little bit more accountability. And, mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. if it's an extra class, I, it could be a, a very minimal fee, but just mm -hmm. I would like to have you visit that. Absolutely. Um, any other questions regarding that? Um, I think it's very important, I really do. Um, you know, it's not my intent, as I said, to break the bank of any parent or student, but I do have concerns if we're continuing to finance, uh, financially support so much of it over and over again. I think the interesting data, and I know my counselors will kill me for saying this, um, would be how many kids are taking the class again. Again, maybe even after the credit third recovery class, time. is there anyone taking the class? Again, for the third time. Are you? Okay. Oh, see that. That's, that was a quick answer, so that scares concern. me. Huh? Especially as they get into the higher levels, the 11th and 12th grade, we've got students. I lay low with my counselor that are repeating freshman level classes. Um, they're kind of going into next year with the mindset that it is free. That it's so they can just do whatever they want to. Yeah. Well, my question would be if they're doing this for the third time. Obviously, the first time in the classroom didn't work, and then the online class didn't work. Allowing them to do it a third time, how is that changing their yeah. learning environment? <laughs> their behavior. Um, really, I mean, we want to have these kids succeed, but they've tried the classroom environment, they've tried the online at home environment. What are we, do, what are we putting in place so that we can catch these kids so that they're not taking the class a third time? I, I think the battle continues to be, I mean, you have the um, Arizona State requirements, um, you know, ADE's requirements for graduation, and as they continue to increase, um, it's unfortunate, but, you know, they, they keep having to take the classes. The things that are in place, I mean, I don't, one of the things that we're doing, for example, in math, um, is doing a math fundamentals class, because we know that our kids are challenged with that. Mm -hmm. And so we are currently in the new master schedule I'm looking at, I believe I still have 16 classes of fundamentals of math. That gives you a clear indication, okay? So I have 16 classes of fundamentals of math, and I have four Algebra one classes. <coughs> Kids are supposed to come to me and be ready to take Algebra one. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I need to make a note here because so many of our kids come from all over the country. <coughs> that is not systemic of MUSD. We have to remember that kids come to us all the time from all over. Um, sometimes 
they're coming with not a transcript in hand. Um, sometimes they're coming and not having been in school for a couple years. Sometimes I can't find a transcript if they're coming from Detroit. It seems to not happen because so many schools have closed. So it's a very interesting dynamic and I don't want to imply that that is all due to because something that we're doing because it's not. I mean, there's a lot of kids in that fundamentals class. So that's one of the things we're doing. It We're doing it within the schedule. Um, we're encouraging these kids and, and, and telling them, look, you have to take this and you have to take this. And sometimes we bump out the elective. Again, I think what we have and what we're faced with is is a much bigger picture. What are our goals, values as a board, um, as a district, and as a high school, and where do we want to put our money, time, and effort? Yeah, I, th I think part of the problem is I see, and I spend a lot of time with those kids, that really isn't an online school, it's an alternative school. Mm -hmm. And it was never Correct. staffed that way. So to answer your question, uh, uh, one counselor is not going to cut it. I mean, talking to some of those kids, they've got issues at home. They are in their third or fourth home out of state. It, it, it's clearly that support before they can even settle in. And I think, you know, to me, and we've talked a lot about it, 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 it should be an alternative school with an mm -hmm. online component, not the way it was set up. We don't so have an alternative school, correct? Um, you will next year. Right. It's going to be called Maricopa Online Alternative School. Right. Um, that does need like to. That. It's a tricky title. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, that, that was one of my. That was one of. Yes. Kind of leading to you know if they've taken the class in the classroom, they mm -hmm. failed it. They took it online at mm -hmm. home, they failed it. So the third time around, do we put them in the online school, or do we let them take the online class again? Um, you know, there's if we do, <laughs> yeah, if we do, um, if we do the math, and correct me if I'm wrong, Miss Whitwer, but if we really look at it. Probably those kids that are heading for taking something the third time probably are credit deficient. At that point, they're going to be referenced down to an alternative school, which is a smaller setting. So Jim is correct. Um, I think that we were remiss in the naming of the school because it truly is an alternative education program for those kids um, that, that, as Jim said, needs a lot of support. That's why there's a behavior tech down there. That's why there's a counselor. Right. and. My hope is to staff it with two uh, teachers because the enrollment right now, uh, I believe Stacy told me, is over 200 kids that we anticipate going into an alternative program. Wow. There's it another is, component we're working on, and CAC has agreed to partner with us on, I don't want to call it a GED program, but basically uh, if we co-partner with them, if kids successfully complete the GED, the carrot is they'll pay for two years free tuition. So. When you have a 19-year-old with four credits, it makes no sense to go that way, but to look at another option. So we're hoping with their partnership, that'll give, an, that'll give another option for those older kids. They'd be 24 yeah, by the time they graduate. I, I have a question. How is it that, I just mentioned earlier, um, that you have uh, maybe a junior or senior level uh, child taking ninth grade courses. What, how, how, are they, how is it that they're being passed on at that level and then all of a sudden they're, they haven't even completed some of their right. ninth and 10th grade level courses. Well, they're not being passed They're on. not passed well, on, well, that's the problem. Well, that's why are they the considered problem. senior or junior? Or because just they're, a, you know, know, whether they're considered a junior or senior is by their cohort year. Right. right. The state okay. really doesn't, so they're you just, know, they may be, their cohort graduation year may be two, 2012, right. but they may right. only have freshman credits. and. We have to distinguish that all the time. So right. they're not being passed on. That's why they're still. So they're just spending four years in, in high school, and there's some, by the time they hit that fourth year, they're just deficient. They're um, deficient. Several, right, or sometimes exactly. by their second year, they're deficient. Right. Um, you know, some of them are fifth year seniors. Some of so them So they have are four years to get all those credits, and, and it doesn't matter whether they're freshmen well, or juniors. Right. It's that's just that we lot. hear that word senior, junior, <laughs> yeah, freshman, is all, by their, is all by their cohort year. Wow. That's right. how the state determines that. Can I throw one more thing on the cost as you're, when you're researching it? Mm -hmm. um, can we also look at, I mean, I don't know if we do, is it a cost per credit? Because I know some classes are only two credits, some are three credits. Um, can we look at that? Maybe it's a cost per credit and not just a flat Yeah, there's no, I mean, every, every single course is broken into semesters. That's what I thought. Yeah, mm -hmm. so for, um, it's per half a credit. Okay. Everything is per half a credit. Mm -hmm. So maybe the cost is per half a credit. Mm -hmm. Correct. Depending on what they need. Yes. Yes. So I think it's how, um, in the overall picture of things, it's how we develop our alternative program mm -hmm. and what are we putting in place for credit recovery. Right. Um, and then it becomes a bigger district uh, 
decisions as to how does that impact your electives, and then it all filters down. And the to, all the way down to athletics. Hmm? In enrichment classes, what would it cost them if they were going to take them at CAC versus? Um, I mean, that, we, we need to look at that, too. I mean, I think it's wonderful that yeah. we provide that. It's free at CAC. Mm -hmm. okay. They can, you know, their junior and uh, senior summers, uh, they mm -hmm. can take they can take CAC for free. Right. For yeah. free. Um, so they can for enrichment. They do that. Um, some of the enrichment courses. There was some language, really interesting language options. Somebody was taking. What? Well, options available if you're Arabic, they do German, Chinese. Chinese. Yeah, they have to mm -hmm. test into those, but they can take the full gamut that any CAC student can take. Oh, for CAC? Yeah, mm -hmm. up to seven hours a semester. Mm -hmm. They could theoretically, if they if they did everything at CAC and at Maricopa High School, you leave could high graduate school with, with an AA yeah. degree the same yeah, time you get right. your high school mm -hmm. right. free. Um, as we look at the enrichment of online, you know, kids that are enrolled in online uh, classes for enrichment purposes, uh, there's 92 courses that kids have uh, enrolled in. The num or excuse me, 92 students have completed 108 courses for a grand total of $9,000 for you. So that is something um, I think you can ask yourself, you know, do you want to, do you want a fee structure for that? Um, and then the home school online, um, at, again, at the time of this printing, I was trying to update quickly. Uh, there was 123 courses, 38 students, um, and our home school online changes. We had, was it last year, the two kids that were in an accident and, you know, the nice thing about that now is that when kids are sent home, we have an option for them. Any questions? Um, a couple of comments as far as the pricing structure goes. Mm -hmm. um, I was really supportive going on that path. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, on the credit recovery side, uh, on the, for the enrichment kids, um, I don't think we ought to penalize success. Right. So I'd be in favor of uh, not charging for those students. Mm -hmm. um, on the credit recovery, um, I don't think a nominal fee is appropriate. Um, I think a fee that has some meaning is appropriate. Um, especially when we talk about taking the same class multiple times. Mm -hmm. If that's the scenario, I would say we charge them our cost in that. I don't know why we would continue to subsidize that behavior. I think that if they do have some student in the game, they will know in advance, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. There's some students not following that program. Absolutely. But uh, I know in college, for example, the students who pay their own way, mm -hmm. they get a lot more out of their academic experience than those who do. Yeah. yeah. I would agree. Mm -hmm. I know because I did. <laughs> uh, but I think that that will trickle down from the parents down to the students. Um, you can certainly have some sort of scholarship type of environment. It will be on a need basis if we feel it's necessary. In effect, providing everybody with right now anyway. Mm -hmm. but, uh, mm -hmm. I would say don't do it just to be a token gesture, but to have it be a all person. Absolutely. I would just like to say I really applaud. I call the two men down there miracle workers. I know. Because there's no way that group of kids would have stayed in school past Thanksgiving. But to get 10 of that group, Again, they're nice kids, but they were so far behind. It, they did an outstanding, outstanding job. And I know we literally had to force this one not to live down there because she wanted to. <laughs> she liked those kids so much. But you're, they did an outstanding job to save kids who would not have gotten through otherwise. Well, I think what's really important to note is those two staff members have mentored oh, those yeah. kids in so many capacities, and it's Amazing. just wonderful to see. Just one more comment on the math. Mm -hmm. I applaud you for doing the return on investment. I think that's really important. <clears throat> we might drill down a little further as far as the, uh, the way I read this is we're assuming that none of the 169 students that we have in the program would stay with us. Uh, so I, I don't know if it's good, bad, or different as far as the cash numbers, but we're going to get a better feel for what our return on investment is. Drill it down. Mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> Will do. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. You are welcome. Good information. Thank you for the opportunity. Interesting. Oh, that's amazing.
Our next work study informational item, it's actually an informational item, is our facility use fee comparisons that were submitted in your packet for our Maricopa Unified School District Performing Arts Center, which were compared to other local performing arts centers. Uh, with the information that was provided, thank you very much to our business department for the research that they've put in and the hours that they've put in researching this. As you can see, our rates are extremely low. And we will, as a business department and district directors, be coming back with higher recommendations to the board, more than likely the first meeting in June. I did, again, want to just give this to you for an informational item so we can start wrapping our mind around what is fair market value. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I appreciate it. I think we're very undervalued for what we have. And as we all know, it's been a learning process in trying to get the infrastructure and the processes in place because it is a new building to our district. So thank you for your patience with that. Questions? I do have a question. We do not have an answer to this, given that you want to prove you can do this, but I know one of the rationales behind how this was structured was it was um, supposed to discover our boss and not anymore. Um, how do on labor, if we have stations that have security, we don't charge for that. Right? Right. So, how, how are, we, are we covering those costs? Okay. Getting labor to outside uses. I am actually going to refer this to Mr. Roush, so I do not give you any incorrect information because I believe I know that answer, Mr. Roush. Yeah, the same question I have. state that uh, one more time please yes my recollection is that this was this was put in place um, with the thought of not this the staff decided to put a fee structure in place that would not have a premium associated to it but it would just cover the district's hard costs mm -hmm. yet there are several labor items that we say not charging. So are we recovering those elsewhere or we, do we, we recover not those we hard recover costs? every all of our labor costs. So um, it, it, if they're um, we're not charging a load in fee, for instance, a load in fee is if they're not using the facility but they are loading loading in there's a time when the um, not but what about stations, techs, and security? Um, do we not provide those? Or? Yeah, we've not had a need to do security. We've not charged for stagehands. We haven't provided labor for those. We've, uh, our, our, our labor, we've charged custodial and the theater tech. Yes, so we've not, um, so we've charged all of our labor out. Okay. okay. The answer to the same I, question, I, yeah. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. um, it just seems like they're apples and oranges because, again, the $10 can't be recovery cost, are they? I just want to clarify. Um, before we opened, um, a, a, a group of us uh, went over and, and looked at all these facilities. And we um, um, com compiled this. And then the direction was to us that that doesn't matter. And so, uh, the direction was come up with just bare bones cost and make it affordable and and so that was my direction right and, and I recognize so. that and, and the, the board obviously wasn't it wasn't the board that oh okay yes. yeah it wasn't the board so, it came, came recommend from superintendent right, right. And, and what's done is done in that regard we look yes. forward to hearing your proposal for right. revised oh, fees okay. in June so so, so it, it doesn't recover life cycle costs um, you're right it doesn't, and it's not comparable. You're right, and that's that's. So we're I agree. Going to revisit it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Based on recoverable cost. Right? Yeah. Oh, that's <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank okay. You. Fine. Thank you. Additional questions, clarifications. You just answered it. <laughs> 
The next item, again, is an informational item. It is the information that was submitted for you as the Budget Committee recommendations were pre presented to me. Following the process, last, the last few years, we have been criticized regarding the budget process. And this year, we took uh, the direction within our directors, within the governing board, to follow the process with fidelity. And that means bringing it to a committee that was representative of our community, of our staff, and bringing the information to them that they could make recommendations that we may not have thought of within our own organization. Again, it is the budget committee recommendations only. These are not my recommendations to the board. We do plan on having those recommendations to you again by the, the first meeting in June. What we're waiting for or not waiting on, we are working diligently on our staffing, looking at uh, the budget implications for the staffing as well as other funding sources that we've become privy to and, and with more solidified amounts. For instance, our Title I allocation had another conversation with him, re with our state representative for Title I, giving us a, a much clearer amount so we are able to give the budget recommendations from our organization as a whole. Questions? And, and Dr. Connolly, the, um, the date again is June, when we have to have this approved is June 15th, 17th? 15th. Mr. Uh, Roush, Ms. Honeycutt, correct? Yeah, the budget's due July. What's the date? Uh, it's, not June. July 15th. it's after that. We have to have a first a proposed budget, and it'll probably be the second board meeting for the proposed, and it has to, uh, and then um, by July 15th, we have to have right. an adopted budget. Okay. So there's, there's, it's a two-fold process, right. the proposed and then the adopted. Now, the proposed can be the adopted, but it can change. And oftentimes, again, we look at a higher rate of a proposed budget because in the state of Arizona, how they do business is that once you do a proposed budget, if, once you do, you do your actual, uh, you can't go any higher. So you want to estimate a little bit higher in your proposed, mm -hmm. and then you'll come back with, with an actual budget. So that's the process in Arizona. Thank you. Any other questions? No, I was on the committee. It was, it was a smart committee. <laughs> sure was. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Conner. I Conner. think we might have bias. Yeah, I feel left out somehow. <laughs> bias board members. Summer school? Yes, summer school. At this moment, I would like to introduce Ms. Eva Safronic, and I'm also going to invite Mr. Rocky Brown, who is our, and I'm going to mutilate your official title. He is the go-to for our programs with the city. So, Safronic? Good evening, board. Um, I'm just here to talk about 21st century summer school programming. We have four sites that will be participating in that. Maricopa Wells Middle School, Maricopa Elementary, Santa Rosa, and um, Santa Cruz. All of these sites were awarded the 21st Century Community Grant, um, and that is paying for the after-school programs at the elementaries and a before and after-school program at the middle school. And we'll also be covering the um, funding for the summer school program. Um, we have currently over 400 students enrolled in the, at the four sites. We are now fully staffed. We are still accepting um, enrollments. We're trying to keep the class sizes under 15. Our elementary schools are um, doing a science-based theme, um, which we're very excited about. The middle school is running Panther Camp, a lot of enrichment activities. We are focusing on academics, but to entice students to come in, we're disguising them in fun, hands-on activities. Um, mm. We are running June 4th through the 21st, um, and at Maricopa Wells, we are partnering with Parks and Recreation, and they will be providing an hour and a half 
from 12.30 to 2 o'clock of um, leaderships and uh, sports activities for our middle school students. Any questions? Very nice. Yeah, classes look really, well, really good. Good program. Inside. We're very excited and we look forward to another really successful summer. Thank you. That's good. Mr. President, members of the board, I'm very excited that we can continue the partnership that even I have worked on for the last year and a half, which is our super teens programs. We're going to continue that into the summer, helping out at Wells. Also, we're looking to help out Desert Wind with their summer camp. Uh, I'm also very excited we've partnered with some of the varsity high school coaches to offer some youth-based sports camps, including football, wrestling, soccer, and basketball. We really want to get these kids involved early. Sports is obviously near and dear to Parks and Recreation's heart, and uh, <laughs> we're really excited about this partnership. We hope we can get a lot of kids signed up, and they all leave with the City of Maricopa, Maricopa High School Rams t-shirt, and wear that to school every day throughout the year. And then uh, finally, we uh, are working on our first summer fun and fitness camp, which will be at Saddleback. And the school district has been wonderful, helping us get the facilities needed and getting the, the word out about this camp. We're really excited. It'll be fun activities. Uh, we want to help out with the fitness component to make sure we're in a constant battle against childhood obesity. So we want to make sure that we're getting kids out there and active, especially during those summer months when, when they're not in school. So we just want to make sure they stay up. We'll try to do our best to educate them to, to your guys' quality and make sure that they're learning some things over the summertime so they're ready for when school starts again. Um, if you have any questions, I would be more than happy to ask, answer them. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Keep up the good work. Yes. In addition to the summer school and the summer activities that they have, we also, again, have received the grant of 125000 which does provide summer school for the Desert Wind School. And it's going to be piloting our blended learning, where we also are going to be able to implement and use some of our professional development. So it's kind of a uh, catch-all for what we need to do to plan for this, this next school year. So again, it's open to all the students at Desert Wind. It's going to be a blended learning program focusing on math and reading. In addition to that, the high school has the ninth grade for all incoming ninth graders. They have the RAM camp. And initially, it was focused on students that possibly needed some additional support, as you see with our math classes that Ms. Celia shared with you. However, with the extra funds that we have received, we will be able to open that up to all incoming ninth graders. In addition, we are working diligently in providing a credit um, enrichment, and there's specific wordings that we have to use within the grant, but they do have the opportunity to take math and reading classes that they possibly um, need that extra support in that you guys have been asking about. So that'll be open to all students. And we have the funding for that. Dr. Conley, um, since you've been able to open this up to all incoming freshmen, how are you going to get the word out to all of them? We have sent letters to some, tar again, targeted, but we are working hard on, on sending connected messages. And it is a challenge just because of the timing of the entire funding. Because this whole time, we typically start summer school planning in January. This year, we didn't think we would have any funds. And here we are with a substantial amount of money that can support a full summer school. We're going to do our very best to make sure that all of the students and parents know. So you've sent, because my son goes to Desert Wind. I haven't received anything about so that will be sent home. We've been working on it this week. So I can drop them off like the last day of school and pick them up in August? <laughs> you have one week with them. <laughs> we'll try to make your life easy this summer. <laughs> Questions? Follow up clarification? Thank you. The, the final uh, work study slash information item is our Rancho El Dorado Lakes parcel. We did request the market comparability and the title report. I did attach the market comparability and the map in your board packet. 
We did receive the title report late Friday afternoon. I did not copy that and give you a hard copy. It's at least 30 pages, so I sent that to you electronically. It does state that we, Maricopa Unified School District, own the land. There are not pre-qualifiers as far as um, the ability of what we use that land for. It is, it is the school district's land. There is a caveat that since it is more as a total amount of $50,000, it does have to go to the electoral vote. And so I know that we are working and finding the deadlines of what, what we need to do to submit the paperwork if that is the direction that the board decides to take. So in next meeting, we'll have a more definitive game plan as far as here are our options and awesome. Yes. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Conley. Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. Second. Motion is made by Mrs. Coutre, seconded by Mr. Irving. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, item E, discuss and approve personnel schedule, which includes resignations, re reclassifications, terminations, non-renewals, stipends, new position requests, employment ratification, leave of absence, FMLA requests, and certified renewals. Mr. Beckett, thank welcome you. to the podium. Yes, thank you. President Bartle, members of the governing board, Tom Beckett, Director of Human Resources. Do you have any questions? I wanted to go ahead and at least maybe make one qualifier. We had a number of questions about the new positions that are being requested on the list. There were job descriptions attached to those. Um, Mrs. Roden, who just conveniently stepped out, <laughs> <laughs> will be able to probably answer most of the particulars. But uh, I just wanted to clarify, that these, these are simply approvals of a position. So if funding does not come through for these positions, they do not need to be filled. And, and that's the caveat. We, we're, we're simply preparing ourselves uh, with some positions we believe that will best position the district to be able to utilize, especially our Title I funds, that uh, we're seeing a significant uptick in, in terms of, of, of amount of money there. These, these positions, if approved, then we'll have to have contracts issued for those individuals. So we need to wait for the funding before we can even offer that out. Is that what I'm understanding then? That is correct. There will be actually an action item. They will be on a personnel schedule. A name will be attached to this position for your approval prior to that, that being instituted. But that'll be after we know we have the funding. Correct. Okay. Any other questions, comments, motions? Move approval of the personnel schedule as submitted. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Beckett. Item F, discuss and approve 2011-2012 budget revision 2 for submission to ADE to recapture revenues due to a recent lawsuit involving retirement issues. Mr. Rausch. <clears throat> Mr. Barrow, members of the board. <clears throat> the budgeting process is a year-long process, and we've, um, uh, and, and as, as so is our annual financial report. So again, we have a proposed budget in June, we have a adopted budget in July, and then um, go through some revisions. So this is just a second revision. Um, really, it's, that's, the retirement recapture is just one part of it. And um, there's other factors um, with, the, with the revisions. And um, that, that was just one factor of that. But there's different recalculations that ADE does and then gives us information and we have the opportunity to increase our budget and so um, we may as well because <laughs> if we don't increase our budget we can't spend the money so again I recommend approval um, it's favorable obviously to every fund um, so thank you any questions in Mr. Rausch? Move approval of budget revision and is there a second? Second. There's a motion and a second to approve the 2011-2012 budget revision 2. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Item G, discuss and approve request for proposal for financial audit services. Fairly <laughs> self-explanatory. 
This is our every fifth year approving? Yes, it's, uh, it's every fifth year going out to bid for an independent audit. Paid for by the state. Paid for Thank by you, the taxpayers. State. Yes. So Go for it, motion is made. Is there a second? second? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Motion Aye. carries. Aye. Item H, discuss and approve a governing board student representative position. Dr. Conley? With conversations that we've had uh, among one another and the importance of making sure that our students of Maricopa have a voice uh, within our governing process, it was a possibility to approve a governing board student representative. I did include a job description, expectations, and qualifications in your packet. Mm -hmm. Questions? Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for doing that. Great idea. Uh, is there a motion? Move. Motion to approve. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Item I, select and approve the 2012-2013 Governing Board Student Representative. When we began discussing possible qualifications for this, we looked at someone within our student body that was mature enough to be able to provide that voice of our students, but also be recognized as a leader within the school. Of course, you look at student body and their student council, and so the, the, the recommendation um, is for Tyler Lovell as the governing board student representative, again, based on the job description, the expectations, and the qualifications that we've provided. I am proud to mm -hmm. recommend Tyler Lovell, I've known since a freshman, and he's couldn't he find Mr. Lovell, would you join us? And Please yeah, join us. Tyler. <laughs> Tell us, besides your last name, what qualifies you to join our team? Well, I do get a lot of jokes on my last name, but um, I just involved in everything, and I honestly do love this district, and I just want to be here and help out and put my opinion in along with those in our school and just represent everyone and hope for the best. So, thank we, you. We look forward to your help. Very thank you. Much. Yeah. So we have one motion. I enjoyed your letter and your resume. And uh, I did not hear a motion. I'm sorry. I thought, um, yeah, Mr. Irving, motion is seconded by Ms. Carla Burnett. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Congratulations. Motion carries. Welcome aboard. <laughs> We will be getting Mr. Tyler Lovell a nameplate, and he will be sitting with us in the director seating area. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Conley. Yeah. Um, is there a motion to adjourn to executive session per ARS 38-431.03A3 and 4 per items J and K? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Excuse us. We will be back. Okay, we are back in open session. It is 8.37. Thank you all for your patience. Uh, item L. Uh, discuss and possibly approve candidate for superintendent's position for 2012-13, 2013-14 and 2014-15 school years. Is there a motion to offer the position of superintendent of Maricopa Unified School District number 20 for the 2012-13 through 2014-15 school years to a particular candidate? Yes, uh, I move that we offer the position of superintendent of the Maricopa Unified School District for the 2012-2013, 2013-2014, 2014-2015 school years to Dr. Stephen Chestnut. Second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Nay. <clears throat> Motion carries three to two. Uh, item M. Discuss and possibly approve performance pay plan for MUSD superintendent. 
In accordance with ARS 15-34140, the governing board must ensure that the contract for the superintendent is structured in a manner in which up to 20% of the total annual salary for the superintendent is classified as performance pay. The statute provides one possible procedure for determining the performance pay portion of the superintendent's contract, but allows the governing board to vote to implement an alternative procedure at a public meeting called for this purpose. The governing board will be discussing and possibly taking action on an employment agreement for superintendent tonight. Therefore, this is a proper time for the governing board to consider whether to adopt an alternative procedure for a performance pay plan pursuant to ARS 15-34140. Is there a motion regarding whether to accept a statutory procedure for determining the superintendent's performance pay or adopt an alternative procedure for determining the superintendent's performance pay? I move to approve the alternative procedure for determining the superintendent's performance pay that is described in paragraph 3.2 of the proposed superintendent's contract for the school years 2012 13, 2013 14, 2014 15. I'll second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Item N Discuss and possibly approve superintendent's contract for 2012 13, 2013 14, 2014 15 school years. Is there a motion to approve the proposed superintendent's contract for Dr. Steve Chestnut? and ask our attorney to forward the contract to Dr. Chestnut. I move that the governing board approve the proposed superintendent's contract uh, for Dr. Chestnut, which is for a three-year term commencing on July 1, 2012 and ending on June 30th, 2015. And our attorney will forward the contract to Dr. Chestnut. Is there a second? Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 841.